Hey guys, welcome back to the shop. So I want to introduce you to the uh, next project that we're going to start on for the American Pacemaker Lathe down at the new shop. And what I have here behind me is the compound that I have removed from the lathe and I have completely disassembled it. And I wanted to do this mainly because I was having problems with the, uh, the handle that you turn to move the top slide. It, was, it had a lot of stickiness to it and a lot of, I could tell the bearings were bad in that. And that was the reason why I wanted to pull that, take it apart and replace the bearings. But we're probably gonna be doing a few other things to kind of spiff, spiffy up this uh, compound and make it a little bit nicer uh, before we put it back together. So we'll jump in here and kind of show you where I'm at, what we're done, and some of the plans for this compound rebuild, okay? This was my setup when I was trying to bump the two halves apart and I was trying to get the lead screw and that bearing housing, that sleeve to remove, you know, come out of the housing. And I was having a tough time getting it to move. I actually could not get it to move uh, no matter what I tried. I even tried to put a little bit of heat on there with hopes that maybe the uh, casting would warm up enough and allow that sleeve to remove. So at that point right there, I just kind of admitted defeat and I wasn't gonna try to take it any further. I hadn't planned on going ahead and, and getting it apart posted some pictures of it and then over on Instagram Syntex machine shop had seen my post and shared these two photos of his saying hey there's a tapered pin there so I went back and checked and lo and behold there is a tapered pin in there I didn't see it because you could see it's covered up with paint and grime throughout the years so I cleaned the area real good with a pick and wire brush and there it is there's the uh, tapered pin this photo here that's why I took it so that you could see it's easy to miss if you don't know it's there. It was covered up with paint and dirt in there. So I was able to clean up the uh, areas of the pin and I got a stare at pin punch and my hammer, gave it a few blows and that pin knocked right out of there. Went from the right to the left side uh, to remove it. So got the pin out of there. Big thanks to Syntex Machine Shop for giving me that tip. And then I set it up just like this, used the wood and the hammer and bumped the two halves apart. So a huge thanks to Syntex Machine Shop over on Instagram. That was awesome. As soon as I made that last post, he informed me that there's a tapered pin that I had missed. And there was, this guy right here, that's what was holding the sleeve in there and why I could not get that out. Over on the, the compound, here's the two halves. The paint on both sides, it completely covered up the, up the pin. I didn't see that it was there. So this is why I wanted to take it apart though, is because look, look at this. You see there's two ball bearings in there and it's just, it has a really rough feel to it. So the bearings are bad, they need to be replaced. And this is what you would feel in the hand wheel whenever you would move it. You would feel it sticking in places. So I wanna get that apart, replace the bearings and I wanna get everything cleaned up real well. So uh, huge thanks to Syntex Machine Shop for helping me figure out the tapered pin that I missed. So then we went over to our Dake Arbor Press and I used that to uh, very easily press the shaft out of the two ball bearings. Wasn't nothing to it at all. Actually, the threads are slightly flared, so I need to uh, put that in a lathe and fix that. But the uh, from there, we just took a small pin punch and a hammer and gently tapped those two ball bearings out of the sleeve, and we'll be replacing those. So next up, we moved over to our Kentmore electric press. This is a good old school press that belonged to my dad. He modified it so long ago and put an electric motor on it and it's always been one of our go-to presses for very simple pressing operations and also broaching keyways but what we're going to use it for here is to remove the lead screw nut and it's got a real long shank that's machined on it 
and that's what they use to uh, hold the nut in place. It just simply presses through the bottom half of the compound casting right there. And I wasn't sure how tight it was going to be, but uh, we set it up and put a little pressure on it, and it easily moved. I think it shouldn't be a very tight fit. That way you can align the threads with the uh, lead screw once you install it. So I may have to do a little polishing on it once we put it back together so that we can get make sure that it's aligned. And then it's got a Dutchman that's tapped in there that keeps it in place from moving. So this is a little bit better look of what that lead screw nut actually looks like once we get it to focus here so you can see it. And uh, this is something that we may have to bring a little attention to. I'm not quite sure, but uh, we'll do some inspection on it to see how it is and see if we uh, maybe can source a tap to make a new one. This worked really good because I was going to clean it up. So instead of using a wire brush, I'm using a cleaner and Scotch Brite. Clean it up nicely. One of the cool things I learned about Aussie Juice when I was reading the book is uh, one of the ways it's designed is that the liquid, the solution here, actually makes the oil and the grease break loose its bond from the metal surface, loosen up and fall away. And then it also, because of the warmth there, it's pleasant on your hands, especially if it's cold you know, in the winter months. You don't have a freezing cold uh, solution there on your hands. And once you're through with your cleaning, the uh, the solution just dries very, very fast. I have to rest the ice pick. It has many uses around the shop. I use it all the time. I use it to push the little ball oilers down to get some of the solution in there.
Here's a uh, general view of all of the parts and components of the compound. And I brought my smart washer around here. This worked really convenient because this is mobile. You can uh, pull it around where you want. And I have a nice work table here that I could uh, you know, use to wash the parts and then set everything here whenever I was done. But anyway, here's the parts there. So this is the, that's the main screw right there. Um, this is the other one. So you got a set of bevel gears that work. So it works about like that right there. Okay. All the parts and pieces for it. This is the nut. This could be the subject of a rebuild right here. I'm not sure. We'll talk about that here in a minute. Okay. Th this is the gib. Got it cleaned up. It looks pretty good. You can see the uh, flaking in there for oil retention. All right. This is the top part of the compound and in the bottom part of the compound. This is the part that, that uh, sits on the cross slide. And of course, this flips over onto that one right there. So as I was saying, the main reason I want to take this apart was not only to clean it up because it was kind of nasty and dirty. The bearings, you got the ball bearings that go in there. It's a pair of them. This is the 3201. Uh, this is an old uh, designation, my understanding. I've already got two bearings ordered for motion and uh, the new size is considered a 6201 instead of a 3201. I believe it was 12 millimeter by 32 millimeter by 10 millimeters wide. But these things, I mean, you can see I'm holding the center race and trying to spin the OD and they are just absolutely crunchy and stiff and don't want to move. And that translated into a really rough feel of turning the hand wheel when you were trying to spin it. It would like, it was almost like it was trying to click into different spots along there, which is not good when you're trying to move it a thousandth or two on the dial. You know what I mean? Here's the other one. It's just super rough feeling. Matter of fact, I'm gonna hold this up to the mic here on my shirt and see if you can hear these bearings. All right, here we go. I don't know if you can hear that. Here's the other bearing. So, don't know if you can hear that, but anyway, those are bad. We're gonna replace those. This is the uh, bearing nut right here. This is a number one bearing nut. That's a, it's a really fine pitch. It's a, it's a 32 thread uh, pitch there. I think it was like 472 is the, is the diameter, 32 thread pitch. Anyway, this is still a standard size. So I've got one of these coming as well for motion and the, uh, the cage that goes behind it there as well. So we're just gonna replace those and replace the bearings. And that is really going to be the extent of the replacement parts of this. However, let me just uh, mention this guy right here. So this is going to be your spindle nut right here. It gets um, pushed up through the bottom of the, uh, the lower piece of the compound over here. All right. And then you've got your spindle or your, your uh, lead screw that goes through here. All right. Let me see if I can... Uh, get this guy started because it is a left hand. So I was going the wrong way. All right. So we have a functional nut. This was completely clogged up with grime. So we got everything nice and clean. We've all, we've uh, cleaned the oil hole out there now. Now I will say the nut will work just as is. We can continue to use this. You can see right here, this is actually the first thread inside the nut there that, that broke off at some point. During its life, it, that might have been caused by somebody trying to uh, disassemble or take this thing, you know, put it put it back together and was messing it up. I'm not sure how that one thread would have gotten broken off unless it was at the very first thread and it was applying too much force and it just ripped it off there. Um, but it's still usable. Now I will say there's some backlash. I don't know if you can see this. So I'm going to try to hold it still. So there is wear in this nut. You're talking about a nut that I think, you know, it's 80 years old. So you got some wear in there, right? I think the problem that I'm going to run into, and I, I haven't really um, checked with any suppliers yet, is making or, or finding a tap that I can use to easily tap this hole instead of trying to machine that. Now what it is though, it's a, it's a square thread. I believe it's a, what they call a modified square thread, three quarter inch, five threads per inch square thread. So 
I believe the square th the square threads kind of got phased out in favor for Acme threads for a little bit easier manufacturing of the cutting tools. Uh, so what I want to do is I've, I've got some sources in, in the industry and I'm going to see if there happens to be a three quarter five square tap still out there on the market somewhere. If I can source one, then I'd like to see about making this, this new nut right here. We'll, we'll buy a piece of bronze and we will machine it to uh, you know, match this shape right here. And then hopefully we can use our flex arm and power tap this with a, uh, with a proper tap. So uh, it's just too early to tell at this point, but I wanted to go ahead and film this segment to show you all the parts and the pieces of this uh, compound disassembled. This is the other shaft and the bevel gear here. This just needs to get polished up and it actually rides through this piece here, which bolts into the front of the compound. So this is just kind of like a plane bearing, okay? But it's still got an excellent fit right there. They have a keyway inside there that's actually for oil. So that these I'm gonna see about replacing these uh, ball detent oilers as well. They still work, but they're kind of messed up a little bit. So that's how that works there. And you just got the other parts. This is the bearing housing. Now I had a time getting this apart and I almost gave up. I actually, I had announced it over on, I made a post on Instagram and I was showing, trying to get this thing apart and I could not get this sleeve to come out because when this, when this unit's together with your bearings in there and this, this right there, the only way that you can get this apart is for this to come out is to come out of the compound <clears throat> this way. And then you can separate the two halves. And I could not get this guy to come out. So I had given up basically. And then uh, one of the guys that followed me on Instagram, I don't remember his name, but his, uh, the, the username there is Syntex Machine Shop on Instagram. He had messaged me a, a couple of pictures of his compound on his American pacemaker and said, hey, there's a tapered pin holding that guy in. And then there, right there, you can see the hole, and this is the tapered pin. And the problem is, is that when I was working on this, there was so much paint around the edges right here that I did not actually see this pin in there. And that's why it was holding it in place. You can see the pin goes through, and it holds the sleeve in. So after he showed me those pictures, it was like, well, that's quite obvious. I went over there and I started cleaning it up and there it was. There you could see the ends of the tapered pin, a few blows with a pin punch and I was able to knock that out. And then I was able to bump the two parts separate uh, using the nut to kind of hold, hold everything together, but bumping it, holding the screw and then having the housing bump through the bearing sleeve right here and bringing it out this way. So that worked out pretty good and we were able to uh, get all of that apart. So another thing I'll probably end up doing uh, to the, this part of the compound here is we may use our power scraper and just do a uh, hatch marks across the surfaces here in two directions, kind of like, kind of like that right there on the gib and not to scrape it for printing or for flatness, you know, printing on the surface here, basically just do our hatch mark on there, our cross hatch pattern across here so that we can create some little valleys for to help oil retention on these two surfaces. So that's something that I plan on working on as well while we go through the rebuild of this compound. So the other reason I wanted to disassemble this and, and bring it into the shop is because I wanna go ahead and start working on the T-nut so that we can add our new tool post to this. So let me grab the new tool post because I'm excited to share with you what we're putting on here. Yeah, there it is. I want you to meet our brand new Peewee Tools size D1 multi-fix style tool post. This thing is absolutely massive. It's uh, bigger than what I thought it was gonna be. And I think it's gonna be a proper tool post for this compound for the American pacemaker. Now, a lot of you guys are probably familiar with my machines, my lays here at the shop. I run uh, two of the original multi-fix brand uh, tool posts, the smaller size. Mine is the uh, size B or type B and uh, much smaller than this right here, okay? But I wanted to go with the same style of tool post for the American pacemaker and 
We're going to be doing the same thing to the uh, Precision Matthews lathe as well. I have a, uh, another, it's not a Pee Wee Tools, but it's another brand of multi-fix that someone had given me years ago, a few years back, and I've been cleaning it up, trying to get all those ready uh, for the Precision Matthews. We'll get to that in another video and show that as well, but same style of tool post. But this is the, again, the D1 size. So whenever I was talking with uh, Peter via email, uh, wanting to acquire the right size for the lathe, he has some information that he has to get from you on uh, the size of your machine, because he makes these in a various uh, range of sizes, everything from a small one that'll fit in the palm of your hand for many benchtop lathes, all the way up to a D2, D2 being bigger than this one right there. So. He's pretty well got a tool post for your application, no matter if you've got a small bench top lathe or you've got a big, massive 40, 50 plus inch swing lathe. He's got one for you right there. So I gave him the information I needed, which is the, the distance from the top of the, the top slide here to the center distance of the, uh, the spindle, um, the horsepower of the machine and Man, I can't remember the other one. It's been, it's been a couple months since we uh, talked about that. But anyway, I gave him the information that he asked about uh, what, what he needed to know to size up the right size. And this is what he landed on right here. He goes, you need a D1 uh, based off the horsepower and the distance that you have right here on the, on the machine. So let me grab the, uh, the tool holder. I got it sitting over here behind me as well. So this is one of the tool holders. You can see how massive it is. That's going to sit down on here like so. So it'll be positioned something like this. So I think my idea behind this tool post is that, or the, the T-nut, is that since we have such a wide compound right here, is that I'm probably going to have at least two threaded holes in the T-nut to be able to position this on either side. Because when I ran the one at motion, we had an Alorus on there. Uh, depending on which way I had the, uh, the compound swung is that I would either be on this side doing my turning, kind of like in this manner, and if I turned it around in line parallel with the axis of the machine, I actually would spin it around like this and then slide it over to that side of the compound. And that's kind of what I want to do here as well. So I'm probably going to end up having some kind of uh, bolt that I machine that actually pulls this down, and then we'll have at least two positions that we can move it to either that side or this side over here for our turning, you know, and keep it, keep it close because whenever you get up close to the chuck, you don't want the compound, you need to have as much room as you can. You don't want your compound over here, you know, getting close to the chuck jaws. I'd rather have the tool hanging off to get close to the chuck here instead of the part of the machine, the compound there. So anyway, I'm really excited about this. And by the way, I'm gonna have an email for you to use to contact Peter for Pee Wee Tools, if you have an interest in one of his tool systems here, no matter what size it is, send him an email and mention ABOM79 in the email. He'll know who you know who's referencing the email, and uh, I'm trying to you know help him out because he's been so generous with some of these parts that he's helped provide for these uh, multi-fix tool posts here, and uh, he's got a great business. He's probably the most knowledgeable knowledgeable person in the world that I know about the multi-fix style of tool post for machines. All of the manufacturers, the original uh, inventors of the tool post, the companies that have built it throughout the years, what has happened to all those companies and who's still providing parts now, including Pee Wee Tools. So send him an email if you're interested, he would be glad to hook you up with your own multi-fix type of uh, tool post for your machine. So as we continue to move forward on our rebuild and repairs for the American uh, pacemaker compound and we get our tool post mounted. I'm going to start acquiring some basic tools that we need to use this. So some turning tools, some boring tools for the bar holder right here and uh, try to have a couple of these ready to go whenever we have the lathe ready to start making some chips. So I wanted to point out so the uh, square shank tool holder right here uh, will accept one inch shank tools or up to inch and a half tools and the way that the, uh, the way Peter does the part numbers on his uh, tool holders here. So this is a D1, D40, one, 40, 180. So what that is is 40 millimeter shank max, and then 180 is how long the tool holder is, 180 millimeters long. 
All right, so you can go from uh, one inch to inch and a half on that. And I don't know if I'm gonna go with one inch shank or inch and a quarter shank. I really haven't decided on that. You know, maybe inch and a quarter would beef it up a little bit, be a little bit more heavy duty and resist a little flexing, but one inch shanks have always done exactly what I need for, for my turning needs, but we'll see. All right, and the bar holder, this is a D1H63180. So it'll hold a round capacity of 63 millimeters or two and a half inch. So this is a piece of two and a half inch chrome bar stock right here, just to show you as a reference. All right, this is a piece that I did a, I did a test cut on and did some turning, but that's your max round shank right there is uh, two and a half inches. And what I, what I probably get end up doing with this, it'll, it'll make a nice machining project for the channel. I would like to get a uh, really nice two and a half inch boring bar for this. And I've got to check to see if it'll actually clamp down on a two inch bar. I don't think it will whenever you put the, with the flats that's um, milled in there from the factory. I don't know if the studs will go all the way down. But here, here's what we can do. We could actually make some split bushings out of some uh, steel stock and have it so that we have, you know, we'll make it two and a half inches. We'll mill one side with a flat for the set screws to clamp down on, and then we'll simply split it and have a split bushing for say maybe uh, one inch, inch and a quarter, inch and a half, and uh, possibly two inch bars, you know, maybe, maybe two or three of those sizes. And I think that would be a valid way to um, have some, um, you know, be able to hold different size bars for the bore and bar holder there. All right, now that we got everything clean, we're gonna move on to our machining and start with the T-nut here that we need for our tool post. So I've got this piece of uh, steel flat bar here. This is, um, I know it's inch and a half, I believe, inch and a half by five flat bar. We're gonna use that, we'll cut it. I'm gonna try to cut it down so that we have just the length of piece that we need right there. We'll go to the mill machine and start milling that. Uh, the plan for that is once we mill it so that it fits in here, it's gonna have probably three set screws that we'll use to bind it up inside of the, uh, the T-slot here. And then we'll take this to the mill machine and we're gonna completely mill it flat so that the T-nut and the top surface of this compound is all one surface there for the base of our tool post, tool post to um, sit on. And a couple of the ways that I use to measure this, we've got a, um, this is one of granddad's adjustable parallels right here. And it's pretty easy just to stick that guy in there like that. And you can either take some mics like this and mic it, or use some calipers to get in here and do a measurement that way. Pretty easy. You can also use it for this here as well if you have the right size. What I did for the slot width is just real easily. I used this uh, shaper gauge right here, planer and shaper gauge. And you can stick it in here like this. I'll turn around that way so you can see it a little bit easier. Just stick it in there like that and just shove it in there, you know, snugly. And then you get in here with some calipers or micrometers and measure your width there just like that. So I thought I would point those out to you. You use these tools to help you measure slots and widths. And I've got my drawing there for all of my basic dimensions of where we'll finish it out at except for the height, because we'll just mill that all one time, clean that up. So this is the next step of the project right here. We're gonna start on this now, but I did wanna point out, I've got a piece of 4140 right here, some two inch, and I plan on machining the bolt for the tool post, once it's sitting on, on here like this. I plan to have a sleeve to kind of make up this large hole in here and we'll have the bolt that goes through the center. Probably gonna use a one inch thread and then we'll machine actually a flange nut all one piece so that when it sits down on top of this right here, uh, this will be bored out to fit the bolt and then it'll just simply pull down on top of that to hold it in place. We'll have two positions on the T-nut so that we can either put it to that side, loosen up, take it out and put it to that side. And the reason why I decided to go with a full size bolt is so that I don't have to pick this thing up. I would, I would have liked to have it as a stud with a nut on top, but in order to move it, I would have to remove this, pick this up out of the way, loosen the stud, put it back and then set that back down. So using a bolt kind of eliminates having to lift this thing every time I want to move it, 
just pull the bolt out, slide it over, stick it back in there, torque it down. So that's my idea for that there. Here's our setup to cut the flat bar lengthwise there. So we had just enough room with the part all the way against the jaw there to be able to lift the head of the bandsaw up and clear to cut it. Now, if this wouldn't have worked, if this is a little too long, you could actually block behind it to kind of bring the work piece out a little bit further to gain some of that height there. But this worked out good going up against the back of the jaw. And what this is gonna allow me to do is to cut me a three inch wide piece, which is gonna be used for the T-nut, because we need it two and three quarter. And I've got it to where once I cut this, I'm gonna have a nice uh, two inch wide block right here that I can you know, be able to use for another project. So we're just over two inches wide. All right, and I wanted to point out, we've got our machinist square here. And I made sure I had to bump this just a little bit, bump it around and make sure it's square. So we used our machinist square here to make sure that we were square against the base of the of the vice jaw and we're making a nice uh, square cut parallel with the side of the block there. So that's good to go. I've measured it and I'm probably going to take this uh, cant twist clamp here, put it on this side just to kind of give a little bit of extra support there because since we did have to bump it, it's not sitting completely flat on that. So having it clamped on this side will be an added benefit for rigidity to uh, hold that there. So. We'll go ahead and give that a shot now. It's pretty square, measuring about two and a sixteenth using the six inch rule here. So nice block to uh, put back on the shelf there to save for another project instead of just turning it in the chips. All right, two and seven eighths. Two and seven eighths. Got a nice square cut on our what's going to be a T nut here. All right, there's our raw piece of steel cut in the bandsaw to make our T nut. I think that's going to work out good right there. So I think from here we're going to move down to the K and T mill. We'll use some of our carbide face mills and get this mill to shape so that it'll fit in there. Got to do our drilling and tapping so that we can make our proper T-nut for the tool post for our American pacemaker compound. <laughs> 